Welcome to our second session of Outdoor Investigator. I'm your host, Agent Abby. Over the next three weeks, we're gonna to bring to you information to help you become a certified investigator. Let's get started with a little bit of um, kind of rules for the road, okay? I call them Zoom Zoom, because they're rules for the road. This is how we should participate. First, make sure that your computer or your um, whatever you're using, whatever device, your phone, your iPad is on speaker view. That way you can see both the speaker and you can see how they're sharing their screen. So make sure you're on speaker view. Second, keep your microphones on mute for now. At the end of the program, you're gonna have an opportunity to share, which will be a lot of fun. We're gonna go into small groups and we're gonna ask some questions and we're gonna share information. If you have a question though, or if you wanna give us feedback, there's gonna actually be a lot of times that we ask you questions. We want you to become familiar with that chat box. So go ahead and open up that chat box and make sure that you know that you can type your first and last name and you can ask any questions. This workshop is gonna be recorded. So be prepared to have your beautiful face on a recording of this great outdoor investigator program. Your parents have already signed a waiver consenting to the recording. Likely your face will be on the recording, but I just got to tell you that it could be, but most likely it won't be. So those are the rules of the road. Let's get started. We want to know more about you. So don't forget to put your first and last name in the chat. And then I'm going to share with you a poll and I want you to answer the poll. Which is your favorite water place to investigate? Is it the beach, the creek, or a pond or a lake? I'm going to share with you a poll and the poll is going to pop up on your screen and you can answer the question. What's your favorite water place to investigate? Is it the beach, the creek, or a pond or a lake? I see votes coming in and so far people are really enjoying the beach. Oh, but the creek almost went in the lead. The beach is definitely on the lead. If you don't see your poll, you can go down to the bottom bar. It'll say polls. You can click on that and it should launch your poll. All right, I think we got almost everybody. I'm gonna share the results. You should be able to see now the poll on my screen. So which is your wa favorite water place to investigate? The beach won with 53% of the votes. The so creek is right there after the beach and then last is a pond or a lake. I wonder why, I bet people think they look kind of dirty, maybe scary. Maybe they know that there's alligators definitely in there. We'll talk more about alligators later. So Outdoor Investigator is a team project. We have a lot of agents on our team and here are some of our agents. You're gonna hear from all of us over the next three weeks. We are University of Florida employees. We are gators and we use university research to inform all of our education and training. So everything that you're going to hear today is from research from University of Florida. So like I mentioned, there's three workshops in this session. There's today, June 30th, and then July 7th. Those are the next three Tuesdays. So to become an certified investigator, you must participate in all three workshops, and then you have to have a total of three shares. Don't worry about sharing, it's gonna be really easy and you're gonna have nine opportunities. You only have to choose three. I'm gonna share with your whoever registered you, um, I'm going to email them and let them know that they can share the, your uploads, like your photos or videos or writings or art using Dropbox. But if they don't wanna use Dropbox, no worries, they can also just email them to me. So today's all about water bugs. I hope you know a little bit about water bugs, but the first thing I wanna know is, can you name one important thing that a water bug tells us about the water that they're in? Go ahead and write in the chat box if you know one important thing that a water bug can tell us about the water that they're in. Type it in the chat box. All right, so one important thing that a water bug can tell us about the water that they're in. Let's see. I don't see anybody with, oh, Luca says it's fresh. Okay, so fresh maybe versus salt water. Evan says it's inhabitable. So that means that bugs could live there. That's great. Any other ideas? Water bugs can walk on water. We're gonna talk about that um, very soon. Awesome. 
All right, so they can tell us some things. Oh, maybe they could tell us it's brackish versus fresh. All right, these are great beginning ideas. We're gonna learn more throughout our time together. So each workshop works like this. You're gonna hear from a scientist, and then you're gonna hear from our 4-H agent who's going to take what the scientist taught us and extend it into an experiment that you can do at home. And then last, we're gonna get a fresh health tip from our health expert. Today, we're gonna learn about sugar. So first up are our agents in training. Agents in training, Cassidy and Juliana are gonna teach us all about water bugs. So take it away, Agent Cassidy. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. All right, welcome Sarasota investigators. I'm so glad you guys are joining us today. We know a lot of you have been with us from our first session of Sarasota investigators, Backyard Adventures, but today is our first program of our new Backyard Adventures where the subject is water. So today we are going to talk about insects that either spend their life living in the water or spend part of their life living in water and part of their life living on the land. Oftentimes, um, the young stages of the insects, the larval stages, they live in the water and in their adult stages, they go outside the water and usually fly around. We will also talk about how insects can help us in figuring out if the lake, pond, stream, or other water body is healthy or sick with pollution. So let's get started. All right, first, when we talk about aquatic or water insects, we refer to them as aquatic macroinvertebrates. I know, very big word, but we will break it down so it actually makes sense. So aquatic macroinvertebrates. Aquatic means water, any type of water, like fresh water or salt water. Macro means an organism that is large enough to be seen with your own eye. An invertebrate means an organism that doesn't have a backbone. Insects don't have a backbone. They actually have an exoskeleton, which means that their skeleton is on the outside of their body, unlike ours, which is on the inside. So a water organism that can be seen with your own eye and doesn't have a backbone is called an aquatic macroinvertebrate. But we're just gonna to refer to them as water bugs. So water bugs can be found in all different types of water sources, from streams to lakes to ponds to marshes, even salt water. Basically, if there's just standing water, water that stays in place after rain, then you can expect to find insects. All right. So, water, or sorry, <laughs> insects can help us determine how healthy our water bodies are. There are certain water insects that we consider hardy, and they do really well, and they can survive in polluted or unhealthy water bodies. On the other hand, there are water insects that can only survive in healthy water bodies because they are sensitive to pollution. Um, we can do a collection of insects or a survey of the number of insects and the different types of insects in a lake and the stream that will help us determine the health of that water body to determine whether it's sick or whether it's healthy and without pollution. So if that water is healthy, then we will see a wide variety of different species, um, including different species of fish, birds, and insects. But if there is a lot of pollution in the water, if the water is sick, there will be fewer insect species and a high number of those tufts insects that can survive in polluted water. There might also be fewer species of fish and maybe even no birds. All right. So an example of a water insect that is very tolerant of pollution is one that can live in really health unhealthy water bodies is um, You know one of them here in the, ma the major larva of the bloodworm? Yesterday I saw a video from Ray Wilderness. Um, he was actually doing a, an expedition about uh, blood worms. Mm -hmm. and We're actually going to get to that. You read my mind. So um, the midge or a blind mosquito is one insect that is very tolerant pollution, as I just said, and we will get to blood worms in just one second. So when this midge fly is in its adult stage, um, it is terrestrial, which means it lives on land and it flies around. But in its immature or young stage, it lives in the water um, until it pupates. The larvae are called blood worms, there you go, and they actually live in the mucky mud at the bottom of the lake or, or other water body that it lives in. 
Blood worms are a very important food source for fish and other aquatic organisms. See, I told you, you read my mind there. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about an insect that represents sensitive species that need clean water to grow. For example, dragonflies and damselflies, as you can see on this slide. Like the midge, the adult form lives on land and flies around, but the larval stage, again, the young stage, lives, into the, lives in the water until it pupates in which it climbs a plant to get out of the water and then becomes an adult dragonfly that flies off. That's its life cycle. Um, so the larval stage of that dragonfly actually has a unique name. It's called a neon. So dragonflies are beneficial insects um, because they are predators. That means they eat other insects. Anaid larvae, the baby dragonflies, are predatory as well. And so they feed on other water insects small fish, and they especially love eating mosquito larvae, which is great for us. So dragonflies and damselflies are very good insects to have around. So there are many other water insects that you can find in a pond, stream, marshes, or lakes. Many water insects like the dragonfly or the midge have aquatic immature larval stages, um, which means they live in the water, but the adults slip outside the water as we just discussed. A few examples are mayflies and mosquitoes. We all know about mosquitoes here in Florida, but the good thing is that the larvae are a great food source for the dragonfly knights, other predatory insects, and especially gambusha fish. Um, we'll see a short video on the next slide that has gambusha fish eating mosquito larvae, which will be pretty cool. So aquatic insects that live their life in the water um, that are common in Florida ponds are insects such as water striders, which can walk on water, whirligig beetles, which can swim in crazy circles, back swimmers or water boatmen that can swim on their backs and stab you with their sharp mouth parts, uh, and giant water bugs that can give a painful bite. Some of the interesting adaptation that these bugs have is how they move through the water as well as how they breathe. Most of them have modified legs that have hundreds of tiny hairs that help them swim through the water. Breathing is different for each water insect. Some have hollow tubes, cause divans that they breathe through when they stick it up through the water surface, like the mosquito larvae, which we will see in the video on the next slide. Other surface, others surface and lightly lift their hard outer wings to trap air underneath their wings, and then they can dive back under the water like a whirly gig, and that's how they breathe. Other insects have gills for short periods of time, like the baby dragonflies. And some have thousands of hairs that cover their body, which traps air against the insect's body. And it can form a bubble um, around the bug while it swims through the water, just like a back swimmer. So as you can see, there are lots and lots of different ways in which insects can breathe underwater. All right, so this is a short video of gambusha fish, also called mosquito fish, um, feeding on mosquito larvae. These fish are top feeders, meaning they stay close to the surface of the water to feed. Since the mosquito larvae have a siphon tube to breathe, they must stay close to the surface as well, which makes it easy for the gambusha fish to feed. All right, let's see. If I can click on this video here. Is that working for you guys? Perfect. So you can see the fish, little gambusha fish, and the mosquito larvae on top. All right. Oops. All right. So we are actually going to explore some of those animals outside in just a few minutes. Um, so we're going to do more than just watch a video on it. So when you go outside to search for aquatic insects, like the gambusha fish or other insects, there are a few items that can be really helpful as an investigator. The first thing that you will need is a net that has a long enough handle that you can reach the water without having to go in the water, because we don't want that. You can use any type of net that will allow the water to pass through. We have a professional net called a D frame, but most people don't have that type of net, and that's okay. Some people have a fish tank, so they can use one of those green aquarium nets, and that would work. But the handle is a little bit short, so if you would want to tape that to the end of a broom handle, per se, so the handle is a bit longer, that would also work too. 
You can also use a butterfly or an insect net. It might be easier to use if you put a rubber band halfway up the net to make the net smaller. Be sure to wash off the net after you have it in the water. Or you can purchase a net online. You will also need a wide bottom bucket as you can see in the top right of this slide, the wide bottom bucket, preferably clear or white so that you can see the water and the animals inside so that um, you can also have uh, somewhere to put the stuff that you collected and observe what you got. That's what that bucket's for. Be sure to have the water in the bucket that comes from the water source that you are sampling. So if you're taking insects from a lake, make sure you get the water from that lake as well. Um, so that way we do not hurt the organisms. The bucket uh, can be anything that will hold the water, as long as it's wide enough where you can get the stuff out of your net without spilling on the grass, which is why we recommend that kind of long bucket there. All right, so with that, let's head outside for a little insect investigating. First, we're gonna do a little poll, I believe. Yeah, thank you so much, Cassidy. Great right. job. See you All outside. Right. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna pop up a poll while they're going outside. So we learned a little bit about Water, well, you learned a little bit about water striders, midges, and whirly gigs. Now my question is for you is which is your favorite water bug superpower? So water striders walk on water and because of their paddle feet and also their very um, buoyant bodies, they were able to move at a speed of 100 body lengths per second. So if you were six feet tall, you'd have to swim at 400 miles per hour to keep up with a water strider. That is amazing. All right, so midges have a double life. Would you like to have a superpower as a double life? That means that you can spend half of your time, maybe like your baby stages, maybe right now you'd live underneath the water, but then when you became an adult, you could start to fly and live on land. That's pretty cool. And then finally, the whirly gig beetle has a superpower of being able to see and breathe both above water and below water. And they can see above and below water simultaneously at the same time. So they have gills that enable them to breathe underwater. And they also have gills that enable them to breathe above water. So which superpower would you like? I'm gonna share my poll with you and you can tell me. Can I tell you guys something about blood worms? Uh, just a second. We're gonna have time to share all of our really cool ideas at the end of this presentation. So the poll is now launched. Go ahead and vote, do you wanna be a water strider who can walk on water at a speed of 100 body lengths per second? Would you like to have a double life and live part-time in the water and part-time on land? Or would you like to be able to see and breathe both above and below water at the same time? Hello, investigators. Can we get a thumbs up if you can hear us okay? We can hear you. We're finishing the poll. So just one second and we will stop sharing the screen and stop sharing the poll and get back to you guys. All right, it looks like we got a lot of votes in. I'm gonna end the poll, share the results. People wanna be a water strider. They wanna walk at great Yay. speeds on top of the water. Right behind them is to be able to see and breathe both above and below water at the same time. And not many people wanna be a midge. Maybe it's the blood word name, I don't know. Maybe it's that they're not that cute, I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm gonna stop sharing the results, stop sharing my screen, and we'll get back to Cassidy and Julia out in the field. Hello investigators, I am super excited to be here today to teach you how to use a net to catch aquatic critters. What you will need for this activity is a net like this one with teeny tiny holes, not big ones, otherwise the critters will escape, and a bucket. You're also going to need a lake or pond like this one. Before you begin you want to make sure that you're practicing good safety habits and so we want to make sure that we check for anthills and alligators. So to check for anthills, you just want to look all around your workstation and make sure that you're not putting your net or bucket on any anthills. If you can see over here, there's one over here and there's one right there. So I'm going to be very careful to avoid those and not step in them or place anything on them while I'm doing this activity. And then you want to check for alligators. To check for alligators, you want to stand at least 15 feet away from the body of water. And then you want to look all around for alligators. It might be an alligator swimming, sunbathing, or maybe even baby gators or gator tracks. You want to look for everything all around. And then once you've looked for one minute, you can take about five to ten more steps. 
and do it again. Look all around for alligators and you want to do it for another minute. If you see an alligator at any time while you're checking for alligators, you need to carefully and calmly walk away and don't do the activity. Okay, now that we've checked for alligators, we need to fill our bucket up with water so that our aquatic creatures have a place to swim while we study them. So I'm carefully going to walk down to the edge of the pond and I'm going to squat down and fill my bucket about halfway. You want to be sure to keep your bucket in the shade because all the aquatic critters that you'll catch will need protection from the sun and they won't have protection in this bucket like they do in a pond because this bucket doesn't have soil and vegetation to protect it from the sun's harmful and powerful rays. Okay, now that we filled our bucket with water, we can take our net and start dip netting. This is called a D net because it looks like a D. It's the net that scientists use to catch and study water bugs. All right, let's begin. Now we're going to take our net to the edge of the water. Once we get to the edge of the water, we're going to place the net straight down and tap a few times on the bottom of the water, the bottom of the pond. And then we're going to do a figure eight motion and we want to keep the net facing forward in the same direction so our fish don't escape. And then we're going to lift it up out of the water without turning it over because we don't want our fish or aquatic bugs to fall out. And then we're going to empty our net into our bucket. We can do that by patting it, wiggling it, or just letting it down in there and sort of nudging it around. And then you want to check your net and make sure there are no aquatic creatures still in your net because there's no water in there to keep them safe. All right, now that we've got our bucket, let's go in the shade and see what we've found. All right, now that we're in the shade, come on over here, Agent Cassidy, and take a look at what we found. So it looks like we caught quite a few gambusia, and those are these little fish you see swimming around that Cassidy talked about a little bit earlier. That's so cool, wow. Oh, and it looks like there might be a spider over there too. Super cool. All right, and now, we want, now that we're done studying the aquatic creatures, we want to put them back where we found them safely. All right, so follow me. So we're going to walk over to the pond and we're going to walk to the edge of the pond very carefully because we're holding this bucket and it might be very helpful for you to have an adult with you to do this part because the bucket may be heavy and you don't want to drop it. Once you get to the edge, you're going to place the bucket down into the water and slowly tip it over so that the fish can safely and calmly go back to where you found them and they can go safely back to their homes. Alrighty, now we put the fish back in the water. That was so much fun. I can't wait for you to do this activity and share what you found in the drop box. Before you empty your aquatic bugs back into the pond or lake, make sure you take pictures for your activity share. All right, now back to the investigator team. Excellent job, agents in training. So now you know exactly what you need. You need some dip nets, you need some buckets, and then you're able to make sure you stay safe by looking for those anthills and those alligators. And then you're able to go in the water with your parents' permission and also your parents by your side. All right, so now we are going to hear from Agent Sarah, who's going to share with us ways that you can create your own investigative tool to look inside the water. Take it away, Agent Sarah. All right, awesome. Hello, investigators. I'm Sarah. I'm the 4-H Youth Development Agent here. And can everybody see uh, my screen? Looks like I got the PDF. All right, awesome. So one way that you can um, check out some of the stuff that you might find in your backyard in a puddle or if you have a pond in your neighborhood or you live near a creek, you can investigate it through the Florida Bug Club. So we'll post this, I'll post this site again in the chat window just after 
um, my presentation. You might see some cool stuff, like we got to see mosquito larvae in the video, or some water striders that uh, um, they talked about, and many of you want that bug superpower. So this week, if you're interested, and you maybe don't have a dip net, you could try to make an underwater scope. So this is an opportunity to kind of make your own little scope with items that you can find in your house. You can choose a container, uh, a coffee can, or I found this was a fruit can that uh, we had some peaches in. Um, you could also try a clear plastic container. You're gonna carefully cut off the bottom. You can use a can opener. Uh, cover the bottom with clear plastic or saran wrap. I decided to reuse some of the plastic that I had in my house instead of purchasing a uh, saran wrap, but some of you might actually have that uh, saran wrap at your house. Then you're gonna attach that plastic to your can or um, container uh, with a rubber band and then explore the water and something might just swim by. So here I am with the, the can, just kind of carefully making sure there's a tight seal with the plastic around uh, my can. And um, if you wanna try, um, if you want to go a little bit deeper with your investigations, you may have some PVC pipe lying around. My husband's an artist, so we have a lot of random things that he collects and finds. And so um, he happened to have a piece of large PVC pipe that I was able to borrow and make a little bit taller underwater scope. You can ask your parents. They might have them or you might see one lying around. You'd want to, of course, be careful about touching things that aren't yours. Uh, so you can see, uh, put the plastic over it, and then you can kind of see, it was able to see, it's hard to take photos through the scope, but when you actually look through it, you can really see a lot of cool stuff swim by. So there's some really cool rocks. I saw some oysters under the thing. Of course, with anything, safety first. You want to have an adult with you when you're in or near the water. You want to definitely wear appropriate foot gear. Make sure to check for alligators and definitely enjoy what you see. We are so looking forward to sharing your photos of the underwater scopes that you might make this week or take photos of you using your scope in action. Here I am actually this morning, um, I trying to see if I could see a few things in the creek that we live nearby. Um, you could also use a plastic tub. So if you, uh, you, could, you can, if you have plastic ware hanging around your house, you can use a plastic tub. And we were actually able to take a few pictures of some of the rocks and you can see some of the muck and stuff at the bottom of the creek. And maybe you'll see a few things swimming by. Fish and some of these bugs move pretty fast, so they're really hard uh, to take uh, photos of. But I'm so looking forward to some of the cool stuff you might see. As I said, I'll share this um, in the chat window with you. And here's a cool invertebrate identification guide that's going to come in handy if you, can, if you do find a lot of cool stuff in your backyard pond or puddles when it starts raining again. So thank you so much. we get added sugar in our diet is by sweetened beverages and most of us don't even know that. So think of replacing some of your sweet drinks with plain water or maybe even do an exercise like this at home where you look at how much you're drinking each day a sugary beverage and you put the amount of teaspoons in the glass so at the end of the day you can see how much sugar you drank. Could you imagine if this was all full? So it's really, um, it's really an opportunity for you to be aware of how much sugar is in some of our beverages. And maybe if you replace that sugar beverage with just water, maybe instead you get those calories from a delicious cookie or something of that nature. So I just challenge you all to do that conversion. Remember, it's just the amount of grams in that drink divided by four gives you the amount of teaspoons. So I hope that was interesting and I challenge you to look at your beverages that you're drinking using that nutrition label. So I know we don't have a lot of time, Agent Abby, and I hope that was quick enough for you, but I look forward to seeing you all next week and hearing more about your wellness moment investigators. Excellent job, Agent Jen. I'm sorry about the confusion when I was drawing on your PowerPoint slide. It <laughs> was very fun to watch. Um, you guys can do the math. 
four teaspoons equals one gram, right, Agent Jen? So yes, ma'am. Figure out how many teaspoons based on how many grams. All right, yeah. so you can either do multiplication or division. You guys are smart, and I know you can figure it out. Thank you so much, Agent Jen. All right, so. Agent Abby, there was one question for Agent Jen about why sugar is bad, and then what, or actually two, and then what about fruit? Okay, so sugar is not necessarily bad, but we want to not have a lot of added sugar in our diet because that can make us obese, it can make us gain weight, and also can lead to some chronic disorders and make us unhealthy, right? So we want to focus our diet on natural sugars. So when you eat things in its full form, like an apple or a banana or grapes, you are getting real sugar and not adding just basically this refined sugar. So it's always better to eat your whole fruits and vegetables. That sugar is okay. That's good for your body. Your body can process that. But stay away from the added sugars. That's where you come into problems with your health. And any other questions we can talk about another time. But thank you very much, Agent Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Agent Sarah. And thanks, Agent I Jen. My dad only because of Agent food. Jen, I was able to look up how many teaspoons per day is recommended by the American Heart Association. So that's a group that wants to look at how healthy your heart is. And they say kids should have no more than three to six teaspoons of sugar each day. So how many grams would that be? Well, three times four is... 12, right? So it's 12 to 6 times 4 is 24. Isn't that right? So summer slide, oh no. So anywhere between 12 and 24 teaspoons of sugar a day. Obviously, it's going to depend on your size and um, your age, but to have a healthy heart. So that's another reason. Awesome job, everyone. So now it's small group time. Yay, we're going to break into small groups. And we want to hear from you. We want to know your name, your school, what grade you're in. What water bug superpower did you choose? And we also wanna know if you know now what's one important thing that water bugs can tell us about the water that they're in. So I'm gonna go ahead and put you in groups. You're gonna get a pop-up that says to join the small group. Please do join the small group and we will get started. All right, so welcome back. Um, I hope you had an opportunity to share and talk more about who you are, what water bug superpower you chose, and also what's one important thing that water bugs tell us. I hope that you share that the thing that water bugs tell us is that whether or not the water is polluted or clean. Remember, there's some bugs that can just tolerate tons of pollution and some bugs that can't tolerate any. So they help us decide whether or not the water is clean or dirty. And that's one way US agencies like the United States Environmental Protection Agency tells us whether or not the water body is clean or dirty is by looking at the bugs. And now you guys know how to do that. Super job. All right, so I think everyone's back. Just a reminder to become a certified investigator, which you will get some cool things like a pencil and a hand lens and a notebook and a certificate that says you're an investigator. You have to participate in all three workshops. So check, you did the first one. Next Tuesday and the following Tuesday, and then you have to share with us three shares, but we're gonna give you nine opportunities. You just gotta do three of them. So here are the three for today. Again, you can go out to any body of water with an adult and you can film yourself or take a video, draw what you would investigate, what you would see. And you share it with us by email or by Dropbox. The second thing you could do is make an underwater scope like Agent Sarah taught you. And then you can share with us your underwater scope. Last, you can calculate how much sugar is in your favorite drink and then tell us. Don't forget to have the person who registered you check their email because they're gonna get all of this information by email as well. Next week, we're gonna hear all about water birds. Yes, uh -huh. Agent Catherine, I cannot wait. Water birds are some of my favorite birds ever. So thank you so much, Agents in Training, Cassidy and Juliana, for teaching us all about water bugs. Thank you, Agent Sarah, for telling us how to make our own underwater scope. Thank you, Agent Jen, for telling us that maybe some of the drinks we're drinking have a lot of sugar and we should start looking at that. And thank you guys for participating. You guys have done an awesome job. We cannot wait to see you next Tuesday. Stick around if you have questions. If not, you can go ahead and sign out and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.